Chicago Theater of the Air presents the world's greatest operettas for the world's greatest radio audience. Another gala Saturday evening, ladies and gentlemen. As WGN and the Mutual Network bring you the program beloved by all America, recreating the romance and melody, the songs and stories of the world's musical stage. Our speaker is Colonel Robert R. McCormick. Our stars are Marion Clare, Eugene Conley, Bruce Foote, John McDonald, and Ruth Slater. Our musical director is Henry Weber. And our program is adapted for radio and produced by Jack LaFandre. Tonight, the Chicago Theater of the Air presents a special adaptation of an immortal grand opera by Charles Francois Gounod, the intensely human grand opera, Faust. tragic but melodically beautiful story of a man who sold his soul to the devil, and a lovely girl who gave her heart to that man. It's an old, old legend that has been told and retold through the centuries, yet it has never failed to stimulate the imaginations of its vast audiences across the universe. However, before closing our eyes to the charms of ancient make-believe, let us open them wide on the stark reality and cold facts of present-day America, and in that direction... Few Americans living today are better acquainted with the reality and facts of this country of ours than our distinguished speaker of this and all Chicago Theater of the Air broadcast. It is our proud privilege to present him now, noted historian, civic authority, and editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune. Ladies and gentlemen, an address on the freedom of the press by Colonel Robert R. McCormick. Freedom of expression is one of the natural rights of man. As long ago as the 5th century B.C., Euripides wrote, This is true liberty, and freeborn men, having to advise the public, makes speak free, which he who can and will deserves high praise. Who neither can nor will may hold his peace. What can be juster than this? But his views were not to prevail for more than 2,000 years. Socrates was executed for expressing views distasteful to the government of Athens. But according to Benjamin Franklin, it was, I quote, Augustus Caesar, who under the specious pretext of preserving the character of the Romans from defamation, introduced a law whereby libeling was involved in the penalties of treason against the state. This law established his tyranny, and for one mischief which it prevented, 10,000 evils, horrible and afflicting, sprang up in its place. Thenceforward, every person's life and fortune depended on the vile breath of informers. The construction of words being arbitrary and left to the decision of the judges, no man could write or open his mouth without being in danger of forfeiting his head. One was put to death for inserting in his history the praises of Brutus. Another for saying, Cassius was the last of the Romans. The Middle Ages are called the Dark Ages. They were not so ignorant that Roman law was not known. We find that this law of Augustus was copied in the British laws of treason of Richard II and Henry VIII. Efforts at freeing expression labored feebly through the ages. In 1644, Milton used the famous phrase, Give me liberty to know, to utter, and to argue freely according to my conscience above all other liberties. But he did not get that liberty. The settlers of the colonies, as we have seen, were refugees from a number of persecutions. From early settlement, they were united against the royal governors and the royal judges. 
Thus it was that freedom of speech came to the colonies in 1728, when a jury following the argument of Andrew Hamilton refused to convict Peter Zenger, charged with libeling the governor of New York. The people of the colonies were now so greatly incensed at their royal governors and judges as to make convictions impossible, so that in 1731, Franklin could write, Freedom of speech is a principal pillar of a free government. When this support is taken away, the constitution of a free society is dissolved and tyranny is erected on its ruins. The fight for more liberal treatment of the press in England was on. Let it be impressed upon your mind. Let it be instilled into your children. That liberty of the press is the palladium of all civil, political, and religious rights of free men, wrote Junior, the anonymous critic of the government in 1772. But he received no liberty and had to remain anonymous to save his life. By this time, Tom Paine's common sense was circulating freely in the colonies. And of this, Washington wrote, by private letters which I have lately received from Virginia, I find common sense is working a powerful change there in the minds of many men. And in June 1776 wrote Jefferson, Putting pressure shall be free, except so far as by commission of private injury, cause may be given of private action. That very month, the state of Virginia first established liberty of the press under the new state constitution as follows. That the freedom of the press is one of the great bulwarks of liberty and can never be restrained but by despotic government. Next, in the Massachusetts Bill of Rights of 1782, the liberty of the press is essential to the security of freedom in a state and it ought not, therefore, to be restricted in this commonwealth. When the constitution was adopted in 1787, it only sought to prevent the Roman-British definition of treason, and therefore adopted Article 3, Section 3, defining treason, and copying the statute of Queen Mary on that subject, the sentence requiring two witnesses to the same overt act. Other methods of abridging freedom of speech in England had included licensing, censorship, libel upon government, prohibition of publishing the proceedings of Parliament, and burdensome taxation. In order to prevent the introduction of these methods, methods of abridgment or of others that might be devised, the First Amendment to the Constitution said, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. This federal amendment was drawn by the same men who had written the Virginia and Massachusetts paragraph, and therefore it must be held to contain every guarantee in the Virginia and Massachusetts constitutions. Of the reasons which compel the framing of the amendment, Jefferson said, special provision has been made by one of the amendments to the Constitution, which expressly declares, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, thereby guarding in the same sentence and under the same word the freedom of religion, of speech, and of the press, insomuch that whatever violates either throws down the sanctuary which covers the others. So came the immortal instrument which for the first time in the history of the world guaranteed freedom of speech and of the press. Next week we will learn how its injunctions have been observed in the intervening years. Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, has been heard in another informal address to the people of these United States. For your copy of tonight's talk, which will well repay further study, write to station WGN Chicago. Now the principals and orchestra, cast and chorus have taken their places on the studio stage. The grand opera Faust is about to be performed. Now prima donna Miss Marion Claire will be heard as the beautiful Marjorie, who gives her heart to Faust, the pawn of the devil. Faust himself will be sung by Eugene Conway. Marguerite's brother, Valentine, will be sung by Bruce Foote, and the voices of Ruth Slater and John McDonald will be heard in supporting roles. Now Mr. Henry Weber conducts the WGN Symphony Orchestra in a prologue music to Charles Francois Gounod's Faust. <laughs>
centuries ago. An aged and dejected man sits in his study and looks longingly out over the village square through his open window. The old man is Dr. Faust, the learned philosopher. It is with heavy heart that he listens to the song of the young people of the village and realizes that such song and gaiety have long since passed him by. of all this useless learning. I... Learning is never useless, Dr. Faust. <laughs> Who are you? I am only a vision, Dr. Faust. Surely your knowledge must tell you that. A vision? Only? Yes. Yes, I see you now. I see you. Only a vision. But still, I am all that your studies have taken away from you. I am femininity, Dr. Faust. Pure young womanhood that is the quest of all mankind. The desire of all you. Oh. If you only had your youth again, I could be real. Real, Dr. Faust. Not just a youth. Real. Real, Dr. Faust. Real. Real. Don't look so startled, Doctor. 
I have not manifested myself to plague you. Just make known your desires, and I'm at your service. My desires? For what purpose are you willing to help me? Not entirely altruistic, I assure you. I am very much interested in your soul, Doctor. My soul? You mean... If you will sign your soul over to me in blood, so that you will be mine after death, I am yours to command in this life anything you desire. No! No! It is sacrilege! Leave my study! Leave it at once! Look! Dr. Faust, look! Look again at the vision before. I, I... I am waiting, Dr. Faust. I am waiting. She's come back. She's come back to me. No. No, she's gone. Not for you, Doctor. Not for you. It will take you to make her yours, Doctor. No. You can give me that you. As I said... On the condition that you sign your pen. Give me the pen, Mephisto. Give me the pen. There. There, my half of the pack is signed, Mephistopheles. What about you? To be sure. The first step is youth, Doctor. Youth and fine raiment. Youth and handsome features. Drink, Doctor. Drink of the next out of you. Give. Give me the goblet.
to glory, so tell me, I still will be first, will be first in the fray, as blithe as a knight in his bridal array, as a knight in his bridal array. Peace and love and innocence and soul. 
the one who sang in my garden. Don't you know, Marguerite? Oh, who spoke? You heard someone, I'm sure I did. Who I am is of no consequence. Someone who loves you since the jewels. Someone who waits in your garden now. Marguerite! Marguerite, do you hear me? Oh. <laughs> Go to him, Marguerite. Go to him at once. Oh. Martha. Martha, come with me, please. I don't know what to do. Running to her neighbor, Martha, Marguerite tells her of Faust's ardent suit and the jewels that have been sent her. Martha's overjoyed at Marguerite's good fortune and accompanies the blushing girl to the garden where they find Faust and Mephistopheles waiting for them. <laughs> Marjorie, my Marjorie, you have come to me. You laugh at me. You think I am foolish, little? Foolish? Oh, no, not foolish. Beautiful, Marjorie. shadows of the night begin to fall. Faust draws Marguerite aside, leaving Martha and Mephistopheles alone. Soon, the spirit of evil manages to elude Martha, and alone in a distant corner of the garden, he sings his incantation.
last, Marguerite returns to her cottage, but Mephistopheles detains Faust outside of her window. Stay a while longer, Faust. You do not know the mind of woman as I do. But, but she said good night. She said... Look! There she is. Why? In the window. She has come to the window, Mephisto. Behold, she opens it. Oh. She looks this way. Can it be that... Why? Why? Marguerite realized it. Months that heap scorn and shame on Marguerite as her love affair with Faust becomes a major topic of conversation throughout the village. Oh, Lord, deliver me from my torment. And kneeling in church with other troubled souls, Marguerite raises her voice to heaven and prays forgiveness. Oh, <laughs> 
Even the tragedy of illicit love cannot overshadow Marguerite's affection for her brother Valentine as the soldiers come marching home. All the girls of the village rush to meet their husbands and sweethearts, join them in triumph and song. who instigated this thing. Did I am the one who would draw swords? You, Mrs. Copley. No, no, stand back, Valentine. Please stand back. Mrs. Copley, to anyone else, I will not stand back now. All right. <laughs> if it is death you want, death it will be. No, no.
applause on a special Chicago theater of the air presentation of Charles Francois Gounod's Grand Opera Faust, adapted for radio and produced by Jack LaFonda. Applause for Miss Marion Clare, who sang the role of Marguerite, for Eugene Connolly, who was Faust, and also for Bruce Footer's Valentine, John McDonald as Mephistopheles, Ruth Slater as Martha. For our conductor, Henry Weber, and a tribute to our speaker of the evening, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune. Tonight's all star, all Chicago dramatic cast. You heard Marvin Miller as Paul, John Barclay as Mephistopheles, Lorette Philbrand as Marjorie, Brett Morrison as narrator, Charles Penman as Valentine, and Carl Conkey as the voice from heaven. Next week, the Chicago Theater of the Air will bring you a special streamlined radio adaptation of Victor Herbert's memorable operetta, The Red Mill. Tonight's music rights are from the Tams Ripmark Music Library. Marvin Miller speaking. This is Mutual. <laughs>